Hello, auction enthusiasts. Now, just last Friday, we saw an incredible sale of Paul Newman's very own 6239 Paul Newman Daytona. And this watch is, in many ways, the most important watch of the last century in terms of moving the collector's perception um, towards a different type of watch. And in many ways, this was the watch which made the sports watch popular and is the reason why things like um, like Rolex Sea Dwellers are worth so much these days um, and, uh, and why now collectors see sports watches as collectible. And this sold for $17.8 million, or just under that price, um, at auction in New York on Friday. And in many ways, this is unsurprising, bearing in mind this is the, the most, um, in many ways, the most sought-after watch in the world, and, and as such commanded the highest price ever recorded, breaking the, um, the previous record set by Patek Philippe a year prior. And as a result, today I'd like to talk about the full history of this, ing this iconic timepiece. However, before I begin the video, I would like to encourage you all to join the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snups, the social media platform for sharing pictures of your collections and interests, and where you can discuss matters of horology with myself and these other enthusiasts, and where I'll do my utmost to reply personally to any questions or video requests you happen to give me. And therefore I would strongly encourage you to follow the link down below, or download the app which is avail available for iOS or Android, depending on what you're using to be most convenient, and, uh, and join the great many others, uh, over 5,000 other members, who are now enjoying these additional features and really using these, um, these extra uh, aspects of the YouTube channel. Now the first watch I'd like to talk about isn't in fact a member of the Rolex Daytona or even the Cosmograph line. This is the Rolex Reference 6234, the Oyster Chronograph. And this is a watch which predates the, the Cosmograph and the Daytona, as this was produced from 1954 until 1961. And this is a watch which, at 36mm, is very conservative in, in size, and was very much Rolex's um, uh, first uh, large-scale attempt to produce a, a conventional two-pusher chronograph. And this features uh, two styles of dial. They were available with, uh, with silver dials, um, whitey silver dials, or the black dials, with these, um, these Dauphin-style hands, as well as these uh, three sub-dials, which, which fit in rather nicely and run off uh, a Rolex 72A, which was basically a Velgeau 72 manually wound chronograph movement. And sitting on top of this, um, this 36mm brushed and polished case, we don't see the normal, the normal bezel with the, the tachymeter that we would normally see on a Daytona, but rather on this version we see a simple polished bezel, which again shows the, the early stage of design of this watch, bearing in mind the, the Daytona we know only came out about 10 years after this watch. And multiple versions of this watch are known to exist, apart from the two colours of dials, whereby you see some with, uh, with larger sub-dials which break the, um, the tachymeter and telemeters around the inside of the dial, whereas on others you see much smaller sub-dials which don't break these, which are in my opinion more elegant, um, but uh, certainly one does see both on the vintage market. In 1961 we see the, 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 the 6234 replaced by an entirely new watch with a new case. And this is the 6238, and this isn't an oyster case, so it actually loses its water resistance for this model, and uh, re retains a, uh, a similar case design, but grows to 37mm to the original's 36. Now, its movement is a slight de development over the original Velgeau 72, as this is the, the Rolex 72B, and, uh, and this was the case until 1965, and from 1965 to 1967, this was updated to a calibre called the 722. And the early models feature a, a tachymeter and a telemeter on the dial, in a very similar way to the, the 6234s. And there are also versions of these early models without any of these, these, these markings on the dial at all. And these are generally referred to as the first run of these watches. But the second run is in many ways more interesting, and can be presented as a, a sort of a, a predecessor to the, the, the full Daytona design that we see later on. And in mid-1962, we see the replacement of the, this first generation of the 6238 with the second generation, which now features Batten-style hands with luminescent sections in them, and these uh, Batten uh, style of uh, indices around the dial, which present, along with, with redesigned subdials, a far more modern aesthetic which carries on to the 1963 release of the first Rolex Cosmograph. And in 1963, Rolex releases the 6239, which is the first Cosmograph and uh, is, is a precursor to the Daytona, because Daytona wasn't yet put on the dial. And this featured a 37mm case and the same Velgeau 722 movement. And the bezel on this watch was the one major change, because this now featured a large and uh, an enlarged and engraved scale of uh, 60 to 300 units per hour engraved onto a polished stainless steel bezel. And this was a departure from the previous versions of this which were on the dial, with a much more simple polished bezel around the, the edge of the, the crystal. This also featured a, a, domed, uh, a domed acrylic style of, um, uh, of crystal, which again protruded from the, the top of the watch and was very typical of the era. 
and the dial was available in two variations. There was one variation which uh, featured a, a silver base and then black black subdials, and the opposite uh, reverse style was available as well with a black base and silver subdials. This also was not technically an oyster case and was only water resistant to about 50 metres. Um, and even then it was uh, fairly limited because it didn't have a screw down crown or screw down pushers, which we saw on later iterations. And in 1965 we see one of the most major changes to the Daytona line. Because now the watches do all feature Daytona on the dial, um, which is an interesting uh, addition to these watches. And in truth one does see some Daytonas from, from 1964 but generally it's agreed that 1965 was the year when it was a, a standardised process. Though not all models received this, it was very much documented at this point, and, um, a, and was very much something that was expected on most watches. And these also featured a new style of dial, alongside the conventional sunburst dial. These now featured a second dial which was, uh, which was known by Rolex as the exotic dial, and which has become known really by everyone else as the Paul Newman dial. Now the changes to this dial are really fairly complete, whereby the only thing that really remains the same are the hands as well as the, um, the, the general layout of the dial. And on the dial we see a setup whereby you have a flat, uh, either, either uh, black or white um, style of, of base with a contrasting colour for the subdials. As well as this, the external ring around the, around the dial um, also matches those subdials in colour. The second track also features these small polished steel uh, square indices with a small amount of, um, of tritium luminova on them as well. And the, the centre center of the dial is very simple and flat and doesn't feature the sunburst effect on the conventional dials. Now the subdials are also very interesting, because we see slightly different segmentation at 9 o'clock on the subseconds, whereby rather than having the usual 20, 40 and 60 graduations, you now have 15, 30, 45 and 60. And these also do feature now, uh, now, now these also have uh, squared off uh, indices around those subdials as well, and the crosshead uh, style along with those um, uh, those, those Art Deco esque uh, numerals on them, which I think add to the flair of this watch and do make it very different and uh, and very different to other watches on the market at the time as well. Now, in 1965, we also saw two new models released, and the first one I'd like to talk about is the 6240. And this retained the 722 calibre of the other models, um, and the same black and white uh, dials in either the, uh, the, 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 the exotic style of dial or the more conventional um, standard sunburst effect version. And these versions featured Baker-like bezel inserts, as well as screw-down pushers and a screw-down crown. And this enabled these to be the first of the Oyster Cosmographs, and, uh, and made them more resistant to 100 metres, which was a real addition to the, the line-up of the, 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 the Daytonas. And this watch is also one of the more sought-after early watches because of the fact that that, uh, that blackened bezel gives the watch a more contemporary aesthetic and, in many people's eyes, gives the watch a more elegant look as well and does hide the scratches that often the, um, the, the bright, polished bezels on the, the earlier versions uh, show. Now, a second watch with a, a Baker-like bezel insert was also released that year and it had the same bezel insert as the, 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 the 6240, uh, but rather this version, the 6241, featured the, that bezel insert in Baker-like going from 200 to 50 rather than the 60 to 300 as seen on the original uh, 6239. But this featured the same case and pushes as the 6239, so that's to say the pump style pushes without the screwing function, the smaller crown, um, and also the, um, the, the slimmer case. And this meant this watch was, wasn't an oyster case and wasn't as water resistant, um, but offered uh, a, perhaps a more usable wear due to the smaller pushes. Also, that bezel insert does mean that this, this model is often more valuable than the 6239, um, making the 6241 rather sought after in terms of um, collectors. Internally, the watch is the same as the 6239 with the 72B movement, um, which again changes its name to 722 later on in 1967. But uh, it also features the, the two styles of dials, so you have the exotic dials with the, um, the, the two arrangements of that, depending on where you have the black and the white. And then also it had the standard silvers um, and blacks of the, the conventional sunburst dial. It is also worth uh, worth saying that there was there was also the the variation of the the Daytona called the 6239/8 and also the 6241-8. Uh, and what that means is the gold variation. And there were a very very f a small number of of 6239s made before 1965 in gold. Um, but after 1965 both the the Bakelite and the non-Bakelite bezel versions were produced in solid 18 karat gold which does add a, a different flavour to this, this style of watch, and these are very, very rarely seen. And they feature slight variations to their dials, whereby the hands were also gold, along with the writing being gold as well, to further emphasise the, um, the general aesthetic of the timepiece. 
On the other hand, no such model was ever seen of the 6240, so that's the version uh, that was the Oyster case. And the gold version of that watch only came later in, in later iterations of the, the versions with screw down pushers. And following on from the 6241 with its, its, uh, its um, style of, of pump pushers, which was incidentally the first of the, the Daytonas to feature on every dial the word Daytona. Before that, it had been very much a haphazard um, uh, thing on the dials, whereby some would receive Daytona, and um, in, in fairness, by the mid-60s, most would receive the Daytona, the, the Daytona text, whereas that was the first to feature the Daytona text on every dial as a standard aspect. And in 1970, we see this, this continued by the 6262, which is one of the most interesting models, in fact, because this featured the same 37mm case and pump pushers as the, uh, the 6241 with its, uh, its non-oyster case. But this now featured an updated steel bezel, which now featured the graduations from 200 to 50, rather than from uh, 300 to 60. And that followed on from the design which was, uh, which was applied to the, the earlier uh, versions uh, of the Bakelite bezel. And we also see a similar Bakelite bezel version of this, this watch, called the 6264, which is identical as well, featuring either the exotic or the standard dial, um, and uh, with the updated movement 727, which was seen on both of these models, um, which featured a, a mild update to this already um, a very robust manually wound chronograph movement. Now, in 1971, we saw the release of two new models, and the first of which was the 6263, which was a 100 meter water resistant uh, version of the watch with screw down pushers and a screw down, screw down and enlarged crown. Additionally, this was the version with the, the Bakelite bezel insert, uh, whilst the 6265 was identical but featured the, uh, the steel uh, polished bezel insert. And in many ways, these are the definitive versions of the Paul Newman Daytona. Because with the Paul Newman dial, or the exotic dial, these are, um, apart from Paul Newman's uh, own watch, the most valuable versions, because they simply have that aesthetic which just works so well. And that, that of course, uh, remains the same in terms of the dial layout, which is also available with the, the non-exotic style of dial, um, alternatively. And the movement remains the 727 movement, which is the, the, the movement, really, of that, that second generation of, of Paul Newman Daytonas. Additionally, it, uh, it retains the, the, the general design of previous models, and in fact looks really exactly the same as the 6265, other than that bezel change. Now, after Rolex had experimented with gold versions in the 60s, they released a full lineup of gold versions in the 70s of all the versions released in 1970 and 1971, so all the versions with the 727 movement. And uh, these were very much following the lines of previous models with the same 37mm case, but now the, the versions with the screw pushers also featured a, a gold ver ver variant, which was a, a real uh, change because previously those had been very much reserved for the most sporting of versions, rather than a more casual chronograph. The one detail that did change on these watches was the colour of the writing on the dial. Because normally, um, or at least on the previous uh, versions of these watches, the text on the subdials had been painted in gold to match the hands and the case. But now, for the sake of, of legibility, because now they were including their, their higher sports watches in this gold line, they removed that, that gilded aspect, and now simply left them, as was the case with the steel models, in white. However, this didn't apply to the second track around the edge of the dial, which followed a, a gold style, um, which again was uh, something which was slightly different to, to previously seen, but I think was very much in keeping with the colour of the case, and added to the luxurious aspect of a, a gold sports watch. Now in 1972, we see an event which would shape the, the world of, of uh, collectible wristwatches. And this isn't strictly speaking the history of the Rolex Daytona, but rather in 1972, Paul Newman's wife, Joanne Woodward, gave him a Rolex 6239, um, which uh, had been specially engraved with Drive Carefully um, on, on the case back, uh, during the filming of Winning, uh, for good luck and, and to, um, to, to give him a bit of, uh, I suppose, uh, an incentive uh, whilst driving. And, uh, and this is a watch which has, in many ways, revolutionised the way collectors see vintage uh, Rolexes, and indeed vintage uh, sports watches as a whole. Because this watch was seen on the wrist of, uh, of Paul Newman on, on the front of a magazine in the early, um, early to mid-80s uh, by a number of Italians, Italian collectors. And they, the, the, they immediately assigned value to the Rolex Daytona, and so as a result, the value of, uh, of Rolex sports watches skyrocketed during that period. And that really is why now watches like the Rolex Submariner are so collectible. Because, uh, because now they, they are assigned a certain value as far as a luxury good goes, not simply a tool. And of course the influence of this watch has meant that uh, its price at, at auction just this Friday was absolutely incredible, with a, a sales price of $17.8 million, 
making it a record for wristwatches. And I think rightly so, if any watch is going to claim that prize, I think this very much deserves it, as far as a truly important watch in terms of collecting as a whole. Now the 1970s and 80s were generally fairly empty in terms of changes to the Rolex Daytona, and with the, the, the same references in the early 70s continuing on until the late 80s. However, we do see a few changes whereby in 1979 we see Rolex releasing a very, very small number of red dialed versions of the exotic dials in the forms of both the 6265 and 6263, but not in the, the pump pusher style versions. And it's, it's, uh, it's rumoured that these dials were produced in the late 1960s and only then released in the late 70s, but um, all we do really know for sure was the fact that these, these dials were released as whole watches in the late 1970s as prototypes, but uh, never really reached the market in, in a proper way. In 1980 we see a minor change to the design of the watches, whereby the crystals, which, which, which remain plexiglass, have, have their, their shape changed. So previously they had a very uh, very clear protruding dome from the top of the, 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 the plexiglass. But uh, on these later versions we see that replaced by a much flatter style of, um, of acrylic or plexiglass crystal, which has a slight dome to it to follow the lines of the case, but nothing nearly as extreme as was seen on earlier models. In 1984, two models of this, uh, this, this watch were added to the line. And these were really variations of, on the style of the 6263 and 6265 with the screw down pushes and crown. And this, this was uh, the, the 6269, and this was a diamond encrusted version, and this came in both a version with an, a, 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 um, a, a, a brilliant cut of diamond around the, the bezel, um, and, and with a simple dial, as well as a version with a fully encrusted dial as well. And this is, uh, is simply a, a version of the 18 karat gold variant of that, simply with the tachymeter removed, and this, this, this diamond set bezel uh, replacing it. And uh, I must say, this is uh, probably the, the least tasteful of the earliest Daytonas uh, ever made, really. But uh, nonetheless, I'm sure that it, it had its appeal uh, for, for showing uh, itself as a status symbol, rather than the professional sports watch that it, it was originally based on. Alongside the 6269 was the 6270, and this was really identical apart from the bezel, which now featured a, a different cut, so it had baguette cut style of diamonds, um, which in my eyes is slightly more, more attractive than the, the brilliant cut on the other version and these are laid out in sort of a pevy way around the edge of the bezel, which is still not to my taste, but I must say I prefer the way they've done this to really draw from the, the aesthetics of the, the bezel itself and put that into the cut of the diamonds. In 1987, I would argue the largest change to the Daytona line occurs, because we see a full change from the previous references to the 16500 series, and this is a whole new design to the Rolex Daytona, with a new enlarged 40mm case, which now features crown guards, and is only available with the screw-down pushers. The watch now also features a sapphire crystal, which, uh, which is something that was never seen prior, and does follow slightly behind the other models from Rolex, whereby in both the Rolex, uh, the Rolex Submariner and GMT Master lines, it was in the very early 80s that we saw these sapphire crystals emerge. We also see a new dial which comes in, in a lacquered black or white, with, uh, with contrasting snail subdials in either black or white to, to contrast the, the standard colour of the rest of the dial. We also see um, uh, loomed applied indices, as well as redesigned hands with a, with a, a black uh, slot down the middle of them to give further texture to this new watch. These watches also feature a brand new movement, and the movement in this case is the, the Rolex 4030. But this is far from a, an in-house Rolex movement because it was in fact based on the Zenith, um, the Zenith uh, 400, which was the movement used in the El Primero. However, Rolex made a few changes to this movement whereby they reduced the, the frequency from 5Hz to 4Hz, so that's 36,000 beats per hour to 28,800 for the sake of reliability. They also removed the date and, uh, and uh, added their own new balance and uh, new escapement to really make this movement uh, suitable for the Daytona itself. And this makes this movement the first automatic uh, chronograph in the Rolex lineup. The steel version of the watch came in a black or a white dial version um, in, with, with the reference 16520. And we also saw several other versions, so for example there was the steel and gold two-tone version, something which hadn't been seen prior to this point in any of the Daytona ranges, called the 16523. And the two-tone version features a slightly different dial which was available either in white or in gold to match the case, uh, the case detailing on the bezel and the central uh, link of the bracelet, along with the crown and pushers. Alongside these two models was also available the, the third version, which was the 16528, which was the solid gold variant, which was available with either a white dial, a black dial, or the same gold dial as seen on the, um, the two-tone variant. In 1990, we see a very crucial change to the design of these watches, which has remained the same until today. 
And this is the fact the bezel changes from running from 200 units uh, per hour to 50 units per hour, and reverts to a setup uh, similar to the original models, running from 400 to 60 instead, which is given the, 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 the particular arrangement that we, that we see on the modern day versions of this watch. In 1991 we see one of the most interesting variants of this watch released, and this is a very very rare run of 10 gold case models with sunburst galvanised dials in this light blue. And these are often referred to as Chairman Daytoners because these were technically identical to the other var variants produced um, in the 16500 line of watches. But, um, but in terms of their, their purpose, these, only 10 of these were made specifically to be given to leading uh, Rolex directors. And so as a result, the Chairman uh, name for these watches has, has remained as watches which were, were designed to be internally given to, uh, to the leading, um, leading members of the company. The very same year, Rolex also chose to, to uh, give the bracelets a polished centre link on the steel models. And this had been the case since the beginning of the 16500 uh, models for the, the gold and two-tone models. But, uh, but uh, Rolex took the decision to make the steel version that little bit more luxurious, and it's something that has remained uh, to this day. And in 1992, Rolex released the 16518. And this was a real departure from previous Daytonas, because this featured an 18 karat gold case with a leather strap. However, this leather strap was built into the case, whereby the strap was removable, but you had an end link that was, um, that was built to resemble the end link of a bracelet between the lugs with a polished centre link and brushed edges. And this really showed a, a departure from their usual, uh, very versatile cases to a far more, um, more standardised style of building the watches. Additionally, the bezel was very different, because it featured a far more modern style of, of layout, which now is, is, is in fact the case on all of Rolex's uh, Daytonas. But back then, this was the only model to feature that bezel style, and, and in fact it was the only uh, watch to feature that bezel style for several years. In 1997, we see the, the, the sort of the sister watch to the, the 16518, because this is an 18 karat white gold version of the watch, with those, those bracelet um, style end links which fit a, a leather strap along with that far more modern uh, style of bezel, which again matches the, the modernity this watch is trying to reach, but still features that zenith movement and, uh, and really all the, um, the internal workings of all the previous versions in this series. And the final incremental development of the zenith uh, era of the Rolex Daytona was in 1998, when the, the tritium on the dial was replaced with Luminova. And so as a result, uh, the, the writing at the bottom of the dial no longer said T, but rather simply had Swiss made which was uh, an interesting um, change and something which we see across the entire Rolex lineup, um, albeit they, they didn't all happen in 1998, we saw some in 1999, um, depending upon the model in the range, but certainly within those two years Rolex had changed completely from tritium to, uh, to, to a more modern Luminova. In 1999 Rolex finished development on, uh, on the replacement for the Zenith-based calibre 4030, and the replacement was to be called the 4130, which uh, in typical uh, Rolex naming systems was really the way to proceed. And this featured a few advantages, notably the fact that this movement was now available uh, to be produced in entirely by Rolex, and so there weren't any problems with manufacturing times that, that, that uh, plagued the early years of the Zenith-based Daytonas. Additionally, the power reserve was increased to 72 hours from the previous 54, making it far more convenient for a consumer. Also, this was, uh, believe it or not, the first version of the Daytona to include hacking, which is a pretty crucial function to be able to stop the second to set the time accurately, especially for something like a, like a, 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 a racing chronometer. This calibre also featured a spiral balance spring from Rolex themselves, and, and generally was, was seen as a far more luxurious piece, and a far more feature-packed piece, especially for the era, when one considers the fact that a lot of brands are only just now moving to a 70-hour power reserve on their watches, or a power reserve of more than about 40 hours. And so as a result, this movement really was ahead of its time when it was released, um, with its, uh, its column wheel um, engagement, and, and a general uh, very careful build to make a, a reliable and, and durable movement from Rolex, which was also extremely accurate and more accurate than previous movements, which again was crucial for a watch of this type. And in March of 2000, at Baselworld, Rolex replaces the 16500 with the 116500. And this has the same case, but has enlarged hands and indices, with a greater luminescent uh, p uh, potential in terms of having the amount of, um, of lume inside them. Additionally, these, uh, the, the watch now features a different layout um, as a result of the new movement. And this includes the, the small seconds being moved to 6 o'clock, um, where they were originally at uh, 9 o'clock, and, and thus they swap with the 12-hour counter of the chronograph. Also, those two chronograph uh, subdials have moved upwards away from the central axis of the, um, of the dial, 
um, to form a sort of a triangular form with either the six o'clock subdial, which is very different to other movements on the market. Also, courtesy of this this new movement, comes a, uh, a case shape which is, is significantly changed because the thickness is able to shrink to 12.4 millimeters, which is quite remarkable for an automatic chronograph of this type. Also, the case now features a po fully polished um, uh, a finish with much softer edges rather than the sharp um, and, uh, and far more aggressive and sporty lines of the previous models with brushed tops to the lugs and polished sides. And three versions of this watch were initially available, and in many ways mirrored the, the, the 1987 models in terms of their names. Because the steel version was the 116520, which featured uh, a black or a white dial. Then similarly there was also the 116523, which was the two-tone version, which again followed very similar lines, with the, the gold bezel, uh, centre link, and, uh, and crown, as well as the pushers. And then of course you had the 116528, which was the solid gold variant, with um, with the full solid gold bracelet as well to match this um, this this rather bright and uh, um, and uh, and very uh, luminous case. The white gold version of this watch only actually returns to the range in two thousand and four with the one one six five zero nine, and this features the the updated bezel seen on the versions designed specifically for having straps, but now has mounting points for a proper bracelet. And also, this watch features the the first uh, Daytona dial to feature angled uh, angled Arabic numerals. Previously, these numerals um, had been upright, um, or, or indeed had always been uh, battens, if, if at all possible. Um, one had only ever seen these uh, numerals on, on gold models, and, and the white gold model was the first to show these angled towards the centre of the dial. The following adjustment to this watch comes in 2007, and across the entire range of Rolexes, be it uh, GMT Masters, Submariners, or Daytonas, we see the rehort of the watches engraved with Rolex, and this is a change which is very much in line with the fact that, uh, for example, when Rolex changed to this newer reference in 2000, they started engraving the Rolex uh, coronet on the, on the crystal to verify that it's, it was an original. And a similar process is, is taken here, whereby the, the rehort of the, the, uh, the inside of the, the case is laser engraved with Rolex and then a crown at, uh, at 12 o'clock. In 2008, Rolex released a whole new, uh, new type of, uh, of material for the Cosmograph Daytona line. And this was the Everose Gold with the reference 116505. And this featured really the, um, the, the, ex the exact same design as any other previous model, but now in this, this rather pinkish gold produced by Rolex at their own foundry. This also featured uh, as a standard setting, or setup rather, the, uh, the 460 modern style of bezel, which I feel was very much in keeping with the way Rolex was slowly developing towards uh, including this throughout their entire range. This watch was then joined in 2011 by the 116515, and this featured a pink gold case, as did the, uh, the previous uh, 116505, except this one featured mountings for a leather strap, um, which again featured the, the style of an oyster bracelet with a polished centre link and those brushed uh, outer links, uh, which, which mimicked the, the opening and the start of a, a bracelet and bridged that gap that you would normally see between the strap and the case. This also featured a ceramic bezel insert and was the first piece to, to feature this, this monoblock ceramic, uh, ceramic insert with the uh, uh, gold um, uh, backing and insert for the numerals. And the bezel itself has been chosen after the, the more modern style of, of bezel seen on certain models, which I think was a very good choice because it, it went extremely well with that, that, ceramic, um, that ceramic base and, and certainly allowed the dial to flow outwards and make the watch appear larger and more contemporary on the wrist. The design and movement, however, remain pretty much unchanged from the, the, uh, the 2000 re-edition of this watch, which in many people's eyes is a very good thing, because it meant the design of this watch, which has become a real classic, remained the same. The next watch from 2013 is the 116506, and this is a platinum version of the Daytona with a, um, an ice blue dial and a chestnut ceramic bezel and, um, and snail subdials. And this is, I'm slightly ashamed to say, one of my absolute favourite Daytonas. Um, I rank this watch very much up there with, uh, with even the, um, uh, the models of the, the 1960s, as far as the ones that I like the most. Because I feel this takes the design of the Daytona and lightens the dial, which was always something I felt was needed on these watches, but places emphasis on the new ceramic bezel, as it's, uh, it's a significantly different colour to the black you would normally see. This is also a very clean design, which, which I feel works extremely well in the modern world, um, where modern uh, luxury isn't based really on, on precious metals and diamonds, but rather on good design. Now this watch was designed to commemorate the, the 50th anniversary of the Daytona as, a, as a, a, an entity in, in the Rolex lineup, and I think did that job extremely well with its very different design, while still paying homage to the past, 
um, through its, its design cues, such as having the red Daytona on the dial, but nonetheless was very much a watch in its own right, and I think a beautifully executed piece. And in 2016, in the form of the 116500, we see the white and black steel versions of the ceramic Daytona. And this watch has become one of the most sought-after modern Rolexes there are, with, uh, with very, very long waiting lists for this piece, and incredibly high resale values, which are, are I've seen upwards of 50% um, higher than the retail rate. And these watches were very much the same as previous models, except now with that ceramic bezel, that Cerachron bezel, which is uh, uh, really a fantastic addition to these watches, and I think makes them look altogether more modern, where previously the design was starting to look a bit dated. And so as a result, I think Rolex really did do something which was conservative with these watches, but very successful in terms of dragging them into the future and, and really helping their design forwards. And so this watch retained the 4130 movement, the, the glossy dial, the, the crown guards and screw down uh, pushers, as well as that 40mm case, but really changed the bare minimum to produce a, a classically correct v a version of the, um, the modern Rolex Daytona. Now the final changes to the Rolex Daytona range came this year in March at Baselworld. And here we saw release the 116515LN, which is the Evero, uh, Evero's gold version with, with the ceramic bezel. Then we saw the 116519LN, which was the ceramic uh, white gold version. And then we saw the 116518LN, which was the ceramic yellow gold version. And these watches were only available on the Oysterflex bracelet, which is to say the Rolex's proprietary uh, rubber strap which features metal uh, inserts inside it and, uh, and one of uh, Rolex's own clasps to, uh, to provide a more comfortable wear than a traditional bracelet. But it's rather curious to see that they haven't actually included the ceramic bezel on the ones which aren't, aren't including the, um, the, 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 the Oyster Flex bracelet, but rather include the full Oyster bracelet, which is a curious choice but certainly is in line with their previous choices to only reserve the newest bezels for the ones on the straps rather than the bracelet models, because those will come afterwards. Anyway, I'll conclude the video here with, with the first Oyster Daytona, the 6240. So thank you very much for watching, and please do like, share, and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to enjoy more content here in future. Also, do please leave your comments down below as to what you think of, of, of the, the Daytona as a whole, and indeed what you think of spending $17.8 million on that particular Daytona which recently sold. Uh, because I'm, I'm very curious to hear what you think. So thank you very much for watching, Some on the Watch Guy, over and out.